uh, this is Mark Zweig, and I'm here with my co-host, Eric Howerton, as well as a very special guest today, Ben Davis, whom we'll introduce in a moment. Um, but this is another episode of Big Talk About Small Business. And uh, we're here in beautiful northwest Arkansas. The weather is perfect outside. Fantastic really is. I drove here on the highway with all my windows down, my sunroof open. Your hat, was your hat on? My hat stayed on. And then suddenly though, like a straw wrapper went flying out of the car. I felt so bad. Was that I mean, from uh, Burger King or McDonald's? It was from my kids. Uh, okay. From Yeah, it was McDonald's, of course. <laughs> um, but you know, it's just like, I'm just like this rampant litterer driving my Mercedes down the highway and throwing shit out the window. It was pretty embarrassing, frankly, although it was just a straw wrapper. But your hair was flowing, though. Yeah, and the Taco Bell bag that I had <laughs> under my seat, fortunately, didn't fly out. But um, but anyway, it's always good to be here with you, Eric. And uh, and Ben, we're lucky to have Ben with us today. Um now, you, you and Eric um, go back, have some connection from the past, don't you, Ben? I think so. So Eric, is uh, he claims to be a OG Gents Place member in Bentonville, so I still need to fact check that, but uh, he has been. Uh, it is true. Okay. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll claim that. So yes, uh, we're, uh, we uh, own the Gents Place uh, brand, and Josh Safran there in Bentonville is our franchisee. And uh, Eric apparently has been been looking and feeling his best thanks to us for five years straight. Well, he is a good looking guy. Thanks, Mark. I I will say appreciate that, man. And it, now I get better looking every time I go to the gents' place. I was actually there yesterday. So Ben, you don't not only wasn't an OG. I'm not only am I an OG member, but I'm an all access member at that. Did you know that? You, wow. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah. I did not. So, I hey. didn't know I was speaking to an all access member. Yeah. I feel like I button up man feel like i should have worn a you know a, a suit and tie or i would have been better prepared for this call <laughs> i'm missing out i don't know what all access means exactly but i'm going to learn about that but um so ben tell us a little bit about your business and your background and how you got into it yeah so i i'll try to be um a little concise but it does go all the way back to 2008 so I actually got an SBA loan two weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed at 25 years old, starting the Jen's Place. Uh, yeah, it was crazy timing. And uh, my banker actually called me and said, hey, you haven't started spending your money from your SBA loan yet. And I said, yeah, you know, the construction's going to start in eight, eight weeks or whatever. He said, you need to start spending money now. Send an invoice to your contractor and so we can trigger the loan. Otherwise, we may take it back from you. So that was my entry into entrepreneurship. And I, I didn't know, and you guys probably have uh, worked with uh, contractors and builders enough. There is a, it's probably the only time it's ever happened in the world where, you know, you call a contractor up and it's like, can I wire you $50,000 today? I don't need an invoice. Um, and so that's what I had to do. I didn't realize I would never, ever want to do that to a contractor. Um, to pay him for work before anything starts. Um, so fast forward, so that's 15 years ago, started the business, crazy time, ended up opening in December 08 in Frisco, Texas, just north of Dallas, and had no experience in the hair business, um, no experience really as an, as an entrepreneur, but I had built uh, with a team, I was a fifth employee at a company called Goosehead Insurance. I'd built that company um, from five to 150 people with the CEO. And so I felt at 25 years old, I, I knew everything and I was going to go out and strike out on my own. And so open the gents place. Um, and, and so the gents place is a membership base. I said, what drew you to hair? Oh, really easy. Um, I hate, I realized I hated two things in life. One was getting my hair cut and the other was going to the grocery store. And I avoided both at all costs and I didn't have enough money to open a grocery store and it seemed kind of boring. And, um, I realized I would go and get my hair cut twice as short as I wanted. So I wouldn't have to go back for twice as long. I hated it that much. And so I, I thought I, if I could fix a personal problem. You're 25, you've had some success in another business. Mm -hmm. You decided to go into this business. You got yourself a loan for a build out. Um, mm -hmm. Then what happened? Open the business, 
with cold water uh, because we couldn't get the hot water to work. Um, the day I opened my business was the day of my son's second open heart surgery. He was one years old. So I worked the front desk from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. that day. And then I drove 45 minutes to go be with him after his open heart surgery. So it was crazy time. Um, so 25 years old, no, no money, kid with health problems. Um, but we were entrepreneurs. We we're able to control our own destiny, which was uh, ultimately all that really mattered to us at that time. Amen to that. So what did you do that made it special? How did you grow this business? Yeah, so the concept was um, what it is today, but probably on, on steroids. Um, we wanted to create a place where I actually wanted to go and get my hair cut. I looked forward to it. And in order for that to happen, we needed to do something more than just haircuts. And so we created a membership-based model that was focused on building community. Um, we call it a community of influential gentlemen. Um, a place where you could expand your business network, um, where you could expand your um, your influence in the community, a place where there was personalized experiences, where you felt like um, you know people knew exactly what you wanted and anticipated your needs. They they had your beverage ready when they saw you you know pulling into the parking lot and, and coming in the front door. And so um, we created a concept that was, I call it a country club meets speakeasy meets barbershop. It was kind of the way I visualize it. So I figured if we could pull that off, that we would create a place where, you know, Mark would want to go to instead of avoid at all costs, like I was doing. Well, clearly I don't go to the barber too often <laughs> or I wouldn't look like this. <laughs> Didn't you say you were, this was for like some kind of gentleman? How did Eric get into this thing? <laughs> that was my thought. Money. Money. So, it's a okay. subscription, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Not too much qualification. <laughs> Do you have a subscription? So, so I'll I'll uh, I'll actually uh, testify as a okay. long term gents play subscriber that I mean everything Ben you talked about that country club act atmosphere, networking, I mean personalization it happens. I mean it's actually a it's you know I think Ben what you're saying is, is you, you hated going to get a haircut but you actually liked being in a network and go in a place where, I mean, there was a place to relax, you know, a place to chill out is actually an experience. That's, I mean, that's what I mm -hmm. enjoy every time I go. And everybody knows your name. They do. Like cheers. Yeah. They actually do. Yeah. It does make a difference. It's crazy. Sure. All the stylists, like even the ones like, I mean, you know, I have one that I go to every time, but I mean, all the stylists know who I am and people at the front desk do greet me with a, with a drink every time. Wow. I got my own locker there. That is so cool. Yeah, it's super chill. I mean, you get super nice lounge chairs. I mean, it's like going to a country club and uh -huh. hanging out. That is awesome. I've had meetings there. Have you really? Well, business meetings and stuff. Yeah, it's great. That is cool. Well, you started in a really entrepreneurial area there um, uh, in uh, Texas, where you are, um, Ben. Um, how did you grow the business from there? Yeah, so Facebook ads had just come out that year that we opened and we took full advantage of that. So our primary uh, acquisition vehicle for new customers was um, displaying ads on Facebook for a completely complimentary member day pass. So it was come in for a day, we'll roll out the red carpet. We were, we we're so good. Let us prove to you that we're worth it. And so we got thousands and thousands of um, form fills online that we ran through a marketing system, went through email, text message, follow up on phone calls, online booking. Um, and we drove a lot of traffic into the business immediately. And we were, it was a very novel concept at the time. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of copycats today, but um, guys were really looking for a place that was other than, I'll call them XYZ clips joints to put everyone in the same bucket. Um, and it was too good of an offer to pass up. So that really built the business over the first several years. Also smoothed out your cash flow, I think, with this subscription model. Well, yeah, the interesting thing about the subscription model is we have a big cash lever we can pull with an annual membership. So, you know, Eric's on annual membership. We've got anywhere from $600 to $8,000 cash lever we can pull if we're really good at what we do. So you could have a relatively slow traffic day in the business and maybe see, you know, 20 or 30 guests. But if you sell four or five annual memberships, you know, you have a four, five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollar day. Um, you've got to be good at what you do. You know, people are taking a risk with their money. 
Um, but that's attractive about the business when you're offering a, a comp service, you've got to convert those annual memberships. I mean, it sounds like to do this, you had to do pretty expensive build out. I mean, you've got yeah. probably more facilities investment than the typical male oriented hair place, I would assume. Yeah, everything about what we do is is luxury. It's it's bigger, it's nicer. Um, you know, restoration hardware, furniture, um, full complimentary, uh, top shelf bar, member lounge, liquor lockers. Um, we want guys to come in and feel at home uh, when they get their hair cut, and hopefully they spend some extra time there and, and invite their friends. Wow, that sounds awesome. I'm going to have to check this out myself, Eric. I might look a little better. <laughs> you might. The next time I see you. you might, bro. So, so, Ben, so now you, you, you grew this business, and do you have a franchise model now at this point with your additional locations? Yeah, so we uh, started with the SBA loan in 08, and in 2016, we decided to franchise the business. And uh, we took on um, some small investors, but big names. So Jerry Jones and Emmett Smith came on as investors and partners in the brand in 2016 and 2017, and we started franchising. Um, so we awarded several franchise licenses early on, and as we started to get locations open, uh, COVID hit. And so we've had it took a few years off from uh, franchising, but just uh, restarted our efforts uh, this year. And our next location will be opening in the Midland, Odessa area, oil country. Nice. Very cool. So when you started your franchise, uh, I mean, had you, you had just one original location or had you already built a couple more in your area? Yeah, we had, um, we had three. We had three locations when we decided to franchise, opened our fourth, right? When we filed all of our paperwork. And uh, my second location is actually in Kansas City. It was an acquisition. So it was probably against all uh, common business practice and, and certainly advice I was being given. But I got a phone call a year into our business in Frisco and someone had built a similar place in Kansas City and could not make it work for a variety of reasons. And uh, we ended up acquiring that business out of state. So my second business was out of state. And that forced me to um, create systems and controls and SOPs early on in the business. And I think that's ultimately um, what gave me the confidence to franchise. We had already kind of quasi franchised and having a location uh, out of state and having to operate it remotely. Yeah. What were some of your learnings about that distance, right? So, I mean, like for anybody that's looking mm -hmm. to kind of like scale their business, but I mean, you went, I mean, I don't know how many miles that is, but I can tell you it's probably a good eight hour drive to get up to Kansas city from, it is. from Dallas. Right. So, but that distance had to cause some, some problems. Cause I mean, just building out, making sure things are running correctly, managing that. I mean, all your SOPs, everything you're trying to instill, I mean, you had to have some challenges with that. I mean, what, what did you, what were some of the painful points of that? Yeah. And I'll even start with just a recommendation before I forget for anybody that's starting a business. Um, is started as as if you are not there physically in the business, even if you are there, even force yourself to be out of the business um, to figure out what you need to systemize um, and create those SOPs early on. You know, I was fortunate enough to be forced to do it because I had this business um, out of state, but um, I would highly recommend doing that is because eventually you probably don't want to be in the business um, every hour of the day. I worked the front desk the first 18 hours or first 18 months for 12 hours a day, uh, most days of the week to learn the business. Cause I had no idea what I was doing, but the challenge is good way to learn. Yeah. Just remote. Do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's only, well, that's, you know, there, there's a bunch of different philosophies out there and, you know, in, in business on, you know, do you learn everything yourself and then you start to kind of delegate it out or, you know, do you delegate the stuff out that you don't want to do and you don't care and you're not good at. And my approach has always been to have, um, have firsthand knowledge of something before I, I delegate it out, uh, because, you know, employees, team members, they don't work out most of the time, right? There's, uh, most people don't stay with you forever. And, um, I need to be able to potentially step in or at least have the internal confidence to know, I know their job and I know how to hold them accountable and I can step in if I need to. And that gives me that confidence that, you know, I don't, I don't need a, a bad team member in my way because they're holding me hostage. 
um, in my business. But to, to answer your question about, about remote management, you know, I, I have a podcast called The Untrapped Entrepreneur. And that podcast is really um, centered around giving advice to entrepreneurs um, on how to you know, create a business life that does not require you to be physically present in a place at any given moment to get the job done. And so for me, I always have a, a mindset that when there's a failure in the business is that systems fail, um, people don't. And I could get in arguments all day long about whether that's true or not. But I think the majority of the time I have found that if there is a problem in the business, it's a system failure and I just need to solve the system and not, not, the, uh, not the person. Um, and so I'm, I'm really big on creating systems in every single aspect of my life from my own personal email management to you know, operating a multi-million dollar uh, facility, um, order management, everything else. And so I, I would say do not wait on creating systems. Pretend like you're not going to be in the business. You're going to be you know, on vacation for 30 days. Um, someone else is going to run it and build your business um, around that concept. Okay. That's interesting. I, I, I think that's a good advice. Um, plan for growth. Don't just expect to be a small operation forever. So mm -hmm. tell us, like, as far as, now I know a lot of hair businesses I've seen, um, mostly they're um, women, female-oriented ones. They tend to operate basically as providing a facility and then they rent out the space to individuals who pay them rent. Is that the way your business model works or do you have some different practices? Yeah, there's really three uh, segments in the, in the beauty industry, at least at the brick and mortar level. So um, the first is a commission-based um, hairstylist. So they're working inside someone else's business, getting paid a commission. And that's mostly female operators working on female clients. And then maybe they grow out of that and they want to run their own business. So you have the booth rental business. And this is where someone's paying typically a weekly fee um, to operate in someone else's building, uh, but they're running their own business. They're booking their own appointments, everything else. So that's kind of a real estate play from an investor standpoint. And then you have the third, which is our segment, which is really a team-based environment. It's all W-2 team members, um, ben very rich benefits. So um, we have matching 401k, um, we have health insurance, we have paid vacation, paid community service, mental health visits, doctor's visits, you name it. Um, some of the best benefits, you know, across uh, industry verticals. And that particular type of team member is someone that is choosing to work in a team environment and may not want all the stress of running their own business, booking their own appointments or um, kind of eating what they kill. So you should be able to get better people, I would think, yeah. with that model versus them having to go out and bring it all in and then just get a percent, you know, either get a percentage of it or pay for the overhead of the business themselves. Seems like you'd get better I people. You get, yeah, it, you know, I think the other side would probably argue this point, but um, someone who's really great at what they do and they charge $200 for a men's haircut and they own their own business and they operate their own booth, they're probably giving fantastic haircuts. So from a quality standpoint, they may be really good at what they do. Um, otherwise, they'd be out of business. I think what you find in our business is you find people that are culturally aligned and uh, aligned from um, kind of a mindset standpoint, like Eric comes into the gents place because he wants to feel a team oriented culture, a team environment. Everybody's working together on his behalf, making him feel, look and feel his best. And if Susie's not there one day to cut his hair, Jenny will be right there to, to back her up. And the, the, there's continuity in his service experience. And so that's what the members expect. The team members um, are in our, industry uh, segment because they want to make friends. They don't want to work by themselves in a little hundred square foot booth. And so it is really a match made in heaven when everybody's getting along because everybody wants to be there and, and connect with other people and build relationships. 
Yeah, makes sense. You know, Ben, one thing that I noticed too, just, you know, as I've been a, a customer is that you also have some pretty neat, this allows you to have good incentives too, right, for the team to where they can be challenged, they have targets and metrics and things of that nature. Uh, is, when did you start deploying, you know, some of those things with your team? Well, I did some research on both of you guys, and I know Mark, I haven't attended his class, but I know Mark um, is very big on transparency and business and um, and being an open book, right? So um, I believe the same thing, and I always had that mindset. And I remember meeting with a competitor who since sold his business to private equity, huge success. I remember meeting with him two years into the business, and I'd looked at becoming a franchisee of his, um, and then I ended up opening the gents place and we met up and, uh, he said, Hey, I hear you're posting your revenue and profit numbers and you're in like, you're going over your P and L's with your hairstylist. Is that true? And I said, yeah, it's true. He goes, well, why would you do that? I said, well, because they need to know if we're making money or losing money. And he's, he was just blew his mind. He's like, I don't think I could do that. That's real too risky. He goes, and he even said, he goes, so what if you make $80,000 in a month in revenue and they think it's profit and they think you made all that money? And I said, well, I'll leave his name omitted. That's why you have to educate them that 80,000 in revenue is not 80,000 in profit. Um, so from an early, early age in business for me, I was just putting it all out there every day. We're posting revenue reports, uh, profitability, productivity. I mean, everything is front and center and it is a culture where you can't hide. I mean, there's stack rank, you know, top and bottom, pretty much everything. And we, you know, we have a team environment help everybody out. But um, it started from the beginning is when you have that transparency, then KPIs start to come up that people care about. They're meaningful to the business and, um, and everyone's aligned and driving the right numbers. Oh man, that's that's really progressive. I think there's such a great opportunity to take a business where people don't do that, yeah, and do that. Oh yeah, you would come in, completely change the culture, and drive to the next level. Yeah, I 100%. mean, it, it's like you know, you're they're going to have more trust for management. I mean, we've talked about these things before that the. You know, the studies that show that the employees of restaurants think the owners make something like 27 times or 29 times what they actually do. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to do that mm -hmm. stuff. And it really is interesting how many business owners are afraid to do it. I think they either are taking too much out or and they're afraid that's going to be discovered or they're not making anything and they're embarrassed. What do you think? Yeah, well, on the expense side, too, we've done some fun things in the past where we have monthly team meeting. We're like, OK, whoever can guess the rent in this facility, you know, closest to rent gets a gift card. And um, you'll hear, I mean, it, it's crazy because, you know, someone will go 5,000, 50,000. And we're like, OK, you have five to 50. These people have no idea, right? They're just throwing numbers out. Um, the other question that we ask them too, that's always fascinating to me, and we do this one more regularly, is we ask them the top 1% or the top, I didn't say top 10%, top 10% 10 of our members, what do you think they make per hour in their jobs? Because we're trying to get a reference point for them because they're in this, kind of, they get paid hourly plus bonuses, commissions, all of that. And I'm always just fascinated with trying to get, to figure out where they are. And again, you'll hear, as low as $25 an hour to as high as maybe 200 an hour. And that's where I kind of give them the big, you know, reveal. And I said, the guy I worked for before I started the gents place 15 years ago, who's now worth several billion dollars. They took, ended up taking the company public 15 years ago, actually it's 20 years ago at Bain consulting. He charged $2,000 an hour for his time, $2,000 an hour, 20 years ago. And people were like 2000. I, they can't even fathom it. It's it's anywhere from 10 to 100 times more than they thought it was. And so we use that as a uh, as a as um, an example and a learning moment for the value of their time. So if you run someone 15 minutes late, that could be $500. Yep. yep. 
That's really good. I like that. Gets yeah, it, it puts them in the cut. I mean, that again, I mean, I think one of the biggest things in business is understanding your target audience, right? Amen. And so if you know who your target audience is, time is so precious to them. Yep. And then you can demonstrate that you respect that, you appreciate it, and you help with that. Then, I mean, you're going to keep pass- happy customers. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, I mean, I know when I go in, I mean, that's like time is of is is on the clock i mean it's like they're sure. they're very much on top of it and so that's a hard thing to do it shows respect i totally. think for yeah. you mm-hmm. if nothing else you know it's like you're con- they're considerate and they're respectful of your time i love that ben that's a really guy. great idea thank you and i had a guy what really burned this into my brain when i was working the front desk first 18 months had a guy i wasn't working the desk at the time and um, someone else working there, and um, I get a phone call, and this member says, "Hey Ben, it's so and so. I just wanted to let you know that I'm canceling my membership, not coming back again." I said, "Oh my gosh, what happened? You you love this place." He said, "Well, you've run me late two times, and I'm done. And you know, the first time it was like it, something happened, and it was excusable, and the second time something happened, and, and there's a reason for it." And I said, well, but, you know, the first time I remember when you were late because I was working and then the second, like today, this. And he said, Ben, let me explain something to you. I'm not comparing your service to the service I could get at any other haircut establishment. I'm comparing the service that you deliver to all the other places that I give my money to, like the Four Seasons, the Ritz-Carlton, the Capitol Grill. He starts listing all these places. And that that burned in my mind that if we're going to serve this type of clientele we have to be thinking about this business completely differently that's a really cool um story um the only but you did get me thinking there for just a minute um it sounds like some of your clients might be a pain in the ass and be a little carried away with themselves. I mean, <laughs> I go to the Capitol Grill, I go to <laughs> Ruth's Chris only. You know what I mean? I, I that must be a hard customer base to take care of. I mean, you must really have to like hold back sometime telling people what you think. <laughs> the hardest, the hardest customer base. Um, but you know what, man? I like a challenge. I really do. I like, I like the guy coming in that's had a terrible day. And you, you can tell he just walks in and he's kicking the dirt. And, you know, if there's a dog outside, he'd kick that on the way in. And, you know, he's pissed off. And I like seeing that guy and saying he has no idea what's about to happen to him. Because we have a system in place. We ask questions a certain way. We have this whole kind of life coaching uh, type of program that we take our team members through on how to turn grumpy mark around you know pissed off mark around <laughs> and um and we I, you know i live for that and that's why i love the the business that we're in i remember walking to my ceo's office and um i told them we're growing this company really fast i recruited all my friends from childhood in they took the company public six plus billion dollar company from nothing i was a fifth employee there and i i walk into my ceo's office said i'm quitting because i found my passion in life and he says what is it? And I said, customer service. And he goes, Oh, Ben, no, no customer service. You're running this organization. Like we're hiring, you know, 4.0 GPAs. We're going to take this company public one day. And I attended this, uh, this class at UT Austin for two days on the experiential economy. I learned about Starbucks and Ritz Carlton and four seasons and all of these uh, organizations that sold basically a commodity product. And they made it really special. And for whatever reason, I just fell in love with that. Um, I love the challenge of taking a guy who has really high expectations and uh, and blowing him away and, and exceeding those. That's a really great idea. You know, I've got a friend, and we need to have him on the show at some time. He owns a whole bunch of car washes and oil change places. Hmm. And they're really different um, than anybody else's as far as his facilities, his people, the training. He took five of his managers to Europe and stayed in five-star hotels because he wanted them to see what really good service was. Mm -hmm. Because he says, you don't even Mm -hmm. see it in this country. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was pretty interesting and progressive, don't you? 
I mean, it's the same idea. I, I, did, the, I did the same thing. I've taken our, our team members to, even if we couldn't afford Ritz Carlton, we took them to the Fleming's bar at the, at the Ritz Carlton in Dallas. Um, we've taken them to five-star restaurants um, so they could get that experience. And I'll tell you a uh, quick story. I, the very first time in 15 years, I've had a candidate hang up the phone on me on an interview happened two weeks ago. And it started to go downhill when I said, have you ever eaten at a nice steakhouse, like for a dinner or a birthday or special occasion? And a hundred percent of the time I've had people say, yes, Th I've interviewed thousands of people. And this woman said, no, she's like, no, like you've never like at a nice place, like birthday anniversary, something. She's like, not really. And I go, oh man, this is just not good. And um, she ended up hanging up on me because I was. I, I thought you were going to say, she said, yeah, I've been to Bonanza or somewhere. You know, you said a nice steakhouse. And, and then you knew that they weren't your your person. But sorry, Ben. <laughs> That's right. Ch Chili's, yeah. Um, but, you know, my, my I, I guess my desire to convert people over to living this gents place experience out and having something better for themselves um, it got in the way and it offended her. And I'm like, I kind of went through my whole spiel and I go, well, but this, like, this is, why do you think someone would pay $250,000 up front for a country club membership and $2,000 a month to maintain it? What do you think they're buying? She's like, I don't know. It's a, it's a golf club, right? And I'm like, yes, it's a golf club. We'll probably golf. And I go, what if it isn't golf? because we all know it's not golf at quarter million dollars up front. You can never get that return. You could play golf a hundred times a day and still be over the public course fees. And uh, she didn't get it. I tried, I even, I even used the, um, okay, you go to, uh, I said, I know you haven't been in a nice steakhouse, but there's a hundred dollar steak at a nice steakhouse that exists right now in this world. And let's just pretend you're willing to pay a hundred dollars for it. And you move the, the steak over to the uh, hot dog rollers uh, at 7-Eleven, right? The same steak. You move, it's $100 over here, and you move it to the hot dog rollers at 7-Eleven. And I'm like, what would you pay for that? She's like, if I'm really hungry, $10. And I go, perfect. I got her, right? So I'm going, okay. So it's worth more over here than over here. It's the same product. Why would someone pay $90 more to go to Capitol Grill? It happens every day. She didn't know. And so I think I just got so frustrated that she said, you know what? This position is not for me. And I said, I agree. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it was an effective interview in the sense that um, you figured out she wasn't True. gents place material, right? It bothered me because I can, you know, I felt like I could convert everybody over to realizing the value of what we do. And she was, she was a tough cookie. Man. Yeah. I think that it kind of actually speaks to your entrepreneurial spirit there trying to, when you say converting her <laughs> over, I mean, cause you can convert so many <laughs> folks into your vision. Right. But uh, I think that, uh, I don't know about you, but I've had some hard knocks and just like, man, I mean, you can invest in people. Uh, but you know, sometimes it's just reality. Like they just, I mean, they just don't get it. They just don't, don't get it. And, yeah. and you're just spinning your wheels and you can pour that energy elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think obviously yeah. you got to have certain standards and if people haven't ever experienced it themselves, really good service, I think it'd be hard to give. And, um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you know, again, though, I just love this idea of these mature fragmented huge industries where people need the basic product or service but here you yep. have differentiated yourself and made it so much more premium and you go after the high end of the market um it's such a good business model for smaller businesses i think but most don't do it i i, I don't know they're afraid to spend the money on the front end or afraid to ask or they all think it's i, I fight this every day it, people who own businesses or want to own businesses and they think pricing drives everybody's purchase decision and mm. just doesn't No, no, it doesn't. No, I think that, it does, you know, and to the point, like, I mean, like, I, I no, Ben, I'm sure that not all your customers 
you know, me being one of them is not all these, you know, the, the high income earning folks, right. That are coming in like, I mean, but, but the fact is, is that these folks are, they work hard for a living and they just genuinely appreciate something good, something good. Yeah. And they're willing to invest in that. And I think you've hit on that. So like you can come in and get that high end service and, 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 you know, without having to pay your arm and leg for it. Yeah, it's expensive mm-hmm. for what it is, but it's not really expensive in the context of life. I that's think right. that's the other thing. That's right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we're like ten or fifteen dollars more per service than kind of the mid tier place. Um, so yeah, from an absolute uh, dollar standpoint, it's not. I want to share one thing too that um, I think maybe answers your question mark, at least in some cases. When you have this highly fragmented market, a workforce that is very low formal education, you have a customer base that is affluent, very discerning, that's high price point. There's a massive gap between where the team member is and where the customer is. And the work that you have to put in to that team member is not like a SOP, follow the SOP training manual. It is an investment into them as a person, as a human being. So there's personal and professional development that needs to happen from the owner, from the leadership, from the brand into these people on a constant, ongoing basis in order to have them start here and move their way up to at least understanding how the customer thinks. And that's what I'm really passionate about. So if you ask me kind of what what business we're in, we're in the business of growing people. And the haircut's just the vehicle that gets, you know, guys in the door and they pay us at the checkout and everything. But that's what I'm passionate about is taking a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 21-year-old, a 25-year-old, a 40-year-old that just has never had personal and professional development, no mentor, nor no coach, and bring them into our world where they say, oh my gosh. I wish I would have come here 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And this is how we've been able to keep some team members have been with us for 14 and a half years. Our average manager tenure is over seven years. It's unheard of in this industry. Sure. I believe it. Well, you, you're kind of trying to raise their expectations in a way for themselves, it sounds like, through this process. Well, yeah. Ben, you're hitting on a universal thread, right? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs... You know, in the very early stages, they think, okay, I, I have this vision. I can see what needs to happen. Everything's on me. You know, I'm the only one that knows what's going on. And they think it's a, you know, especially in the tech world. Yeah. Right. And all the software and all that industry that's growing, that it becomes more about the programming. It becomes about the technology, oh, the yeah. automation, all these right. things. Mm-hmm. And they think that you know, it's, it's not a team play, but the reality is, is every single business, and I've been around a lot of tech and software businesses too, in my time in some of the biggest and smallest, but like the pouring into the team, yeah. developing the individual person, you know, and trying to get them to, you know, to basically to mentor them up and to take an ownership and having confidence and leading other people, you know, is, is absolutely critical. I mean, it's hundred percent critical. And most people don't want to do it. That's what I was kind of getting at, Mark. Most of these entrepreneurs that I've met, they go, Ben, I don't know how you do it, how you deal with all these crazy hairstyles, how you deal with these people, how you deal with this. You should come over to my business and manage a bunch of NBAs. And I came from that world. I came from, you know, a a startup where I did, I did that. And, um, and so it is, I think a lot of people are afraid to address these problems. They, they don't chase they, they chase opportunity and they chase what other people are succeeding in, 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 in business. And they go there. And for whatever reason, I am sure there, I have a disease of some kind. I chase problems. I really, I really like to solve problems. Mm, I don't think it's a disease. Let me ask you a question though, cause I've, I've something I've been really interested in, in learning more about, and I think there's probably a lot of listeners to franchising, right? So you, Mm -hmm. you started a business, right? You got your first location going, you did a couple more, right? Cause you saw the opportunities there, but then you, what triggered, what was actually triggering your, 
your ambition and, and to go into franchising, the franchising model of the business? Like what triggered that? And then tell us a little about the the challenges that that were part of fr- actually franchising. Yeah, so I, I had the belief back in 2016, and, and I think this has changed a little bit, that in order for a gents place to be successful, there needed to be the the man or woman owner there shaking hands and kissing babies. And like, that's what made the gents place work. And I convinced myself that that was, uh, you know, that was the only way to do it. And so franchising kind of lends itself to that model of that person being there locally in the community. Um we found that that's not necessarily the case. It's a good thing for sure. If you can have that, you have a Josh and Emily Safran in Bentonville, they're going to run that Bentonville location much better than I would um, remotely. It's going to be more personalized. They're going to see people and play tennis with them and all of that. And so the franchising model, um, if you have a business that is dependent on building relationships, I think the franchising model is great. The challenge is you have to have a Josh and Emily Safran. And not everybody is Josh and Emily. Um, some people are not in their business very much. They're doing two or three or 10 different things. They're entrepreneurs, they're absentee owner. And that's where it gets a lot more challenging where how can you replicate what Josh and Emily are doing and what Ben did back in 2008 to 2016 being everywhere all the time? Um, how can you replicate that? And so that's where um, we're using pretty sophisticated marketing techniques and systems. And I'm not going to be one of those, like, we're not a haircut business. We're a technology business. We're not in that position, but I can tell you that we do use technology. We do use data to personalize and best serve our guests. And we're just getting started, um, in doing that, um, in doing that at the next level. And so I think what you'll see, you know, going forward from us is, We'll open corporate locations, we'll open franchise locations, but we're going to pick the franchisees that we know are going to be like a Josh and Emily. I'm not just saying that because I'm on a Bentonville show and you guys know them. They just do an exceptional job. I'm really glad to hear you say that because I I thought you were going to go a different direction. Mm. I thought you were going to say you want to have a business that can have an absentee owner Mm. and all that. I'm not a big fan of those businesses. I mean, it seems like that would degrade what you're trying to do. Um, so you need to be very selective and you need people who are, who are highly involved, I would think. I mean, or the, you know, the thing is not going to, it's not going to represent what you're all about. No. And, and, um, we have been able to have a blend that works, you know, our most, our highest revenue locations, um, Well, our highest revenue location last year was a franchise location. Our highest revenue location this year is, um, and maybe I'll take the top two spots or or my locations, which I'm I'm very rarely in. But in those locations, you have a manager that's been there for uh, 11 years and one that's been there for eight years. And they have a true sense, trained by me, kind of grew up, grew up both uh, personally and professionally, been through divorces, been through having kids, been through life together. And so they treat that as if it's their own. And so that's where, you know, if you, if you, if you don't have a franchisee and you're going to grow corporately, you better have somebody that lives and breathes that business and loves it almost as much as you do. Yeah, I can see that could work. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not the same thing as like, I'm selling a, I'm retiring from Tyson and I've got half a million bucks and I'm going to open this thing because I don't really want to work that hard, Ben. I'd worked hard in my corporate life, but this seems like it could be good. That's not the guy you want. I would think, no. you know, no, I'm going to spend no. half my time here and half in my house in freaking Colorado or some shit like that. <laughs> you know, nope. I see a lot of those nope. guys fail. I mean, yeah, you can bring people up like you did. It's like a farm team. You know, you work them up through every job you hold their hands and yeah coach them daily and they turn into people who think like business owner like you but just the new franchisee you know you just kind of you wonder about that if if they're not willing to make that investment into their people i mean we talked about that gap if they don't have the energy to invest to close the gap 
then it's not right for them. There are absentee owner franchise models that are great where you don't have to close the gap. It's a yogurt shop. So you have the, the, the customer, the customer and the, uh, and the cashier may be in the exact same place a lot of the time. And so, um, you don't have to teach them how to be a great business person. You just need to teach, you know, find someone that can show up and follow the SOPs. That Tyson guy that's got a half million bucks, we would tell him, go find one of these other models that fit with absentee ownership, but you're going to get clobbered in our business because you're going to have a hairstylist that breaks down on you and says, her car's broken, she's getting divorced, This she's a single mother, and then what do you do? And if your response to that is, I don't want to deal with this shit, then you're not going to be a good franchisee for us. Yeah. that's. It sounds like the construction business, except it was guys and their cars were being repoed. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it was like this one this one guy named Gator. He lost his Monte Carlo SS <laughs> and his Cavalier Z24 at the same weekend. Wow. That's a bad weekend, you though. know? That's a bad weekend. I mean, the next weekend, they're going to jerk the double wide off the, the lot. I mean, it's... <laughs> but yeah, no, I get what you're saying, and, and, and that makes a lot of sense. So your selection with your franchisees, I mean... Imagine you've probably learned some hard knocks on that at some times, or maybe mm-hmm. you've, you've had some really great experiences. I mean, what, what kind of advice would you give to, you know, to a listener that's, that's considering that? Yeah. If they're considering it, um, as a business owner, thinking about franchising their business, um, you know, there's a bunch of legal steps and requirements and costs associated with that. And when you get through those hurdles, which that could be enough to scare you off, it's kind of like going public, you know, you get halfway through and you go, what are we doing? This is going to cost us $2 million a year to service it. So you have to kind of jump over that hurdle. And then when you finally go live and you're, and you're taking on franchisees, it is a 10 year agreement and 10 years, believe it or not. And unfortunately is longer than most marriages in the United States. So you've got to think about it through that lens. Um, And I'll just kind of leave it at that, right? There's a lot that goes into that. If you're on the other side and you're considering buying a business, starting a business, or buying into a franchise as a franchisee, um, what I've found is the best fit for a franchisee. So if you're you're thinking, okay, I want to own a business. Am I a good franchisee? A good franchisee, from my experience, has been someone that does not want to take the enormous risk to start something on their own. They've decided they they think that's too risky. Yeah. So it's like that's step one. A good franchisee says, Ben, I would never want to do what you did. If someone says that to me and they're still interested in owning their own business, I want to talk to that person. If they come in saying, hey Ben, you know, I like what you do, but have you ever thought of taking the beams off the wall and yeah. changing the they furniture and doing this. They know what the system is, man. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. That's funny. Well, you'll get a lot of MBAs and engineers who might start doing that to you, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, learn it. Self-actualization. <laughs> learn it our way first. I mean, that's always the thing. I think it, it, you see it with employees too. Yeah, you want to be open to new ideas and everybody's, you know, creativity. But when they just get there and they already want to change it and they haven't figured out maybe why things are the way they are first, that just bugs the hell out of me. It really well, does. Uh, to your to your point, something my uh, my multi billionaire former CEO and, and mentor taught me um, probably the first couple weeks on the job is listen, execute, add. He said, Ben, listen to what we're telling you to do, then do it, and then add. Then tell us how we can make improvements. And you have different types of people. You have the people that come in and they will listen, and then they'll say, but it, but at my old company, we did it this way, and they skip over execution. Then you have people that won't listen and they just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the type that needs to get my hands in and, and just do it and execute without listening. And then they tell you it didn't work. So that's like me trying to put the cat tree together that came in from Ikea or Amazon, right? I'm like, I don't need instructions. Let me do it. And then I blame the cat tree for it. 
but the truly the most dangerous person in business for at least for us is a person that comes in or the franchisee that comes in they listen they execute and then that's it and they listen and execute and they're like robots they're like yes sir boss man i'm here just tell me what to do and we never get the ad out of them and so those are the ones that hold a business back from growth. And so we require that, but you got to go in that order and we expect the ad, tell us when it's not working or that you can do it better. Um, because that's what causes us to grow. Well, you can't just do listen, execute because you can't anticipate every single problem that mm -hmm. you're ever going to have that tell them how to deal with it. If it comes up, I mean, it's just, you can't. Mm -hmm. So that's where it breaks yeah. down. I would guess. Hey, Ben, in the few minutes we got left, yeah. we got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. First is, sure. what are your plans? I mean, like, so you've, you've, you've built this business, it's growing. I mean, what, what's your, what's your plans? Are you going to continue to try to can scale this out as, as much as absolutely possible? I mean, do you have a, I mean, what's your foresight on that? Yeah. So we, we just built a 2.0 model, which we were waiting to start franchising again until we had this done. So we launched the gentstore.com. And the gentstore.com is a way to um, serve our members outside of just grooming services where they can buy. We have thousands of products on there from $30,000 electric vehicles to $1,000 leather bags and high-end apparel and, and everything in between um, where they shop on the site and they earn 20% uh, of their purchases um, convert into annual membership credit so they could earn down their membership dollars. And so now we're kind of surrounding our members both offline and online in a way that allows us to deliver luxury to them to deliver emerging brands and new things and community and so the gent store is going to evolve over time but um, now that we've got that in place we want to uh want to grow uh we're going to grow we're opening another location soon and really hit january 2024 hard in um announcing to the world you know the new gents place model and we did a really good thing as we blocked every competitor out of uh, of doing what we're doing with the technology partner who's the largest in the industry and so we think we've got a little bit of runway to get this done um to prove out a, a new financial model and uh we feel like we've built a, a moat around the business that um is worth making a, a big investment in so I'm, I'm personally making an investment um into the company and growth and uh, we're going to ask franchisees to uh, to do the same in your store ben do me a favor man there needs to be i can't find it and i mean this might be a little bit gross but a good like nose trimmer <laughs> there i they can't find one i, I, I can't yeah, you can't find one i've got an 80 volt co uh volt cobalt that does a wonderful does job it? it's a weed whacker and a nose trimmer <laughs> Well, okay. No, I'm kidding. That's it's. Uh... Mark, if you could commercialize that, we'll sell your product on the on Eric, the store. Until you're my age, okay? I mean, but you then, think it's bad now, but it is a problem. It is a problem. I mean, like I, 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 I keep know. people keep saying, "Well, have you tried the wall? What is it? Wall? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I'm like, yeah, I've tried that. I've tried like a this. I've tried tool that. for your nose. Yeah, you, I mean, and it's battery operated, and yeah. it doesn't really work. No, it just kind of pushes things down. <laughs> It's like a bad lawnmower it with is. a dull blade. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, well, Ben, do you have advice on that, man? I mean, is there one? No, no note taken. There is one. And we're, we, uh, we're about to pull in a significant amount of product from some very big retailers that you have all heard of into the store. So you're going to see, you'll, you'll literally see Gucci and Balenciaga and North Face and Nike and gift cards show up on the site here pretty soon. And uh, I can get you a nose trimmer, man. There's no problem at all. <laughs> Thank well, you. I appreciate that. The, the problem is when you get to be my age, the hair on your head, not only does it stop growing, it falls out. Right. But it makes up for it with your nose and your ears. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> you guys are young. You haven't been there yet, but I'm sure Ben deals with old farts like me over there. <laughs> but um, I'm going to I'm going to put you down for uh, wigs, Mark. I'll get wigs on the side as well. So <laughs> but I do. But Ben, yeah, we, we do have some some products um, that that um, we'd love to talk with you about sometime that I think, you know, might fit in with your audience. And um, and, you know, it, it does make sense. I mean, if you capture this group mm -hmm. of highly affluent people of taste. Yes. They then, want good stuff. Yeah. Then you should be able mm -hmm. to 
to, um, you know, tap into that audience and meet some of their other needs. I mean, it just makes sense mm. to me. Yeah, it's a it, it's a big big feat, big project, but we're gonna we're putting a lot of uh, energy into it. It's a huge undertaking. I mean, completely understand that that retail space on on the digital side. The uh, other question I had: so your podcast, Untrapped Entrepreneur, right? Is that what what, it's, what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, how do folks get onto that? How, where can they go find that? Um, and you know, what's your What's kind of your strategy on that? I mean, not necessarily strategy, but like how many episodes have you created? How many are you going to do? I mean, what's your, what's your vision on that? Yeah. So you can go to untrapped.com, um, to find all the episodes you got and, that and domain, more about the podcast. .com? You got it's a good domain. I got, I got it, baby. I got it. You know, this is, uh, and it did, it did, it didn't cost that much money, but it cost, it cost enough for, it cost enough for me to be forced to start a business out of them. Um, so I, I'm sure there's a lot of crossover on, on the site or on, on the podcast. Um, but what I'm really focused on is there's so many podcasts out there that's like, how did you do it? What are the three keys to success? How do you buy the Ferrari? And, it, and those don't really interest me. What I really want to know, because us as entrepreneurs, we all talk behind the scenes and, you know, we're whispering to each other, like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing to you. And it's like, no, I don't either. <laughs> hey, that's gonna be our opening social media Did clip you just right there. Hear the I'm conversation it. Eric and I were having before we started. <laughs> <You're No. right. laughs> it's awesome, perfect. So I'm tr I'm trying to get that out of entrepreneurs that haven't really shared it before because they've been too busy doing the podcast circuit, telling everyone how great they are. And um, and so the first season of the show. Uh, we shot, I think, seven episodes. That's rolling right now. Um, and we got some really good content and some great guests. Season two and beyond is going to be themed out. So season two is about being married and uh, an entrepreneur. And so the challenges, the traps that come along with that. That's cool. But Eric and I had an episode like that with our wives. Yeah. Um, yeah, we brought them in the show. Out. Yeah, you should check that out. We brought them in the show. It was fun. It really was. It was really educational, though. <laughs> For I mean, both Mark and I. Like, yeah. We actually were nervous about that before. We were actually we saying, were. <laughs> hey, Mark, keep be on your bed. I mean, it's legitimately yeah. talk about the shit that we say behind the closet. We don't want to have problems yeah. when we go home. <laughs> exactly. After this, I was like, right? Mark, you need to uh, last <laughs> right before the weekend. Yeah. It's like, don't ruin the Dude, weekend. Yeah, don't Please. ruin the weekend. <laughs> but no, that that is a big, big topic. And I talk with my students about that too with your your mate or your partner or your spouse you know you got to pick the right mm -hmm. person obviously and and you've got to have a lot of mutual understanding about what this really means the commitment that you're making mm -hmm. and uh, it's hard for people you know I, I my last wife I've, I'm on wife number three I always tell people if mm -hmm. you want to get business advice I'm generally pretty good but when it comes to like relationship advice, you need to question the source. But um, actually, I've learned yeah. a lot from that. But my second wife, <laughs> she she did not come from a family of entrepreneurs at all. Yeah. And so it was really, really mm -hmm. difficult for her to understand a lot of the risks and commitments and mm -hmm. and all that we have to do. So anyway, that sounds like a great um, season. I, I'm really interested to listen to those and yeah i, th I think yeah. That the, so I'll, uh, I'll start recording season two in november and uh should be out uh december january i think january sweet man super cool love it well yeah. we need to uh keep connecting on that because i think that i mean it, it, there's there's just so much content to talk through right and i think that it's going to be helpful for listeners i mean this point where we're all doing our shows you know to make sure that entrepreneurs know that they're not alone is one of the biggest things mm-hmm Right. And I think mm -hmm. to that point about the spouses, it's like, it's hard as an entrepreneur, like we're pretty bullheaded. You know, we've talked about oh, yeah. that a little bit, right? Almost, almost to the point of narcissism, almost, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, like, to, like we want, we want them to understand us, like what Mark was just talking about, but also how do we understand our spouses? Because, yeah, you know, I mean, like they, they're going through some stuff as we're going through stuff, you know, and if you have a spouse mm -hmm. that actually cares about you, they're watching you. Yeah you know, like put everything you have into what you're going after. And I mean, that that's affecting them, you know? 
I think mm. the other thing is too, is like you're used to being the boss too. Yeah. And then you come home and it's like, um, I don't work for you. Uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't have that problem now. I just right. abdicate whatever it is. It's like, yes, of course, honey. <laughs> you know? Well, I'll tell you one story that we're going to, so we're going to open up season two, episode one with my wife and I talking and, and being interviewed. And uh, one of the stories I'll, I'm going to share in that, and I'll share it here is, um, you know, one day my wife and I are working together in the business and um, she was reporting into me, which I know you're probably thinking like, okay, you, you, you idiot. Like we could have told you not to do that. Um, but, you know, I leave the house and she calls me and I'm on the phone driving away. And she is just complaining about everything. Her job sucks and this. I'm telling her it's not a job. You own the business. Um, and then I just, I got tired of it. So I just turned around without hanging up on her. And so I'm just like, uh-huh, okay. And I turn around, I go back in the front door and we're still on the phone. And I walk over to her desk and I just put my palm on her laptop and close it. And just said, you're done. You're fired. And, uh, and she's like, well, but I got to get this and this done. And I've got to call this person. I got to email this person. I'm like, you are done, 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 done. You're gone. And, um, wow. And that, that didn't work out too well. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst. Mistake we'll save the rest heard. of the story for episode one, but <laughs> man, man, that's, that's some of the worst wow. mistakes I've ever heard an entrepreneur make in my entire life, man. And I you know. guys are still married yeah, though, right, Ben? <laughs> been together since we were 16 years old, still married. And she's, you know, I think she's actually in, uh, in, in hearing distance from us. So I'm probably going to get shit for, you know, talking about this. She's a great woman. Yeah, you, can tell yeah. her, you can tell her, I said, she's a saint. And uh, <laughs> undoubtedly to put up with that, but, um, I can't wait to hear the story right. from her, from her oh, perspective This is, it, that I'm tuning in on that episode. I am too, man. I am seriously going to be listening to this one. It sounds exciting. <laughs> well, it's great. And you know, the thing with these podcasts is there are a zillion of them and you do have to be different. Yeah. You know, I think we struggle with that, but I, you know, I guess our whole thing is we like having successful people on like yourself who are mm -hmm. honest and will tell the truth and who've done it. And so that's mm -hmm. really what we look for. I mm -hmm. think more than anything, as far as guests go is everybody's got their own success model. You know, there's no one best way to do anything, but I think the more stories mm -hmm. we have of people who have done it, um, they all have something to offer mm -hmm. and, and that hopefully helps our listeners figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can tell you, I, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot every time we have a guest and definitely have on this one too, Ben. We really appreciate yeah. your time, man. I, I love your model, Ben, and um, what you're doing and, and really appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. So, um, one last thing, what is, um, the web address for the gents place? Okay. So go to the gents place.com and I'm going to give you the gents store.com, uh, our new website that just launched this week and then untrap.com. If you want to follow the uh, podcast, that's fantastic. And so those are both on the, on the gents place. It is www the gents place, right? You don't even have to put uh, the W's in. We paid extra for that, man. You can just put the gents place. Dot com. Okay. The gents place dot com. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, it's, we, we appreciate uh, you here today, being here with us today. We could talk forever, but um, we're out of time now and uh, we will end this show with, this has been another episode of big, big talk, talk about, about small business. business. Thank y'all been blessed. Thanks, Ben. Thank you guys. Thanks, Ben. See you, man. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Big Talk About Small Business. If you have any questions or ideas for upcoming shows, be sure to head over to our website, www.bigtalkaboutsmallbusiness.com, and click on the Ask the Host button for the chance to have your questions answered on the show. Stay connected with us on LinkedIn at Big Talk About Small Business. And be sure to head over to our website to read articles, browse episodes, and ask questions about upcoming shows.